introductions. All right, looks like Craig got the recording going. Um, welcome again. My name is James Burnham. So today we're talking muzzle loading and muzzle loading muzzle loader deer hunting. And with us today we have Craig Kiger, our shooting sports coordinator, and conservation officer Phil George. And these guys know all there is to know about muzzle loading. So we're gonna we're gonna pick their brains. We're gonna listen to them, talk about it. Uh, we've got some slides that we're going to go through really quick because there are some specific rules regarding muzzle loading and the muzzle loading deer season. And um, yeah, we're going to get into it. So Craig, why don't you why don't you introduce yourself and and take it away? So Craig Kiger, shooting sports coordinator for uh, about the past 15 and a half years, coming up on 16, and I've been a muzzle loader deer hunter for probably five to ten of those years. Um, just depends on what's going on. If we had a, a slow um, rifle season, we would add uh, the addition of the muzzle loader and be able to go out and hunt a little bit longer. Uh, so it's been a fun way to get out there. Bill, why don't you tell us about yourself a little bit and maybe your muzzle loading experience? Uh, my name is Bill George. I'm the Southeast Metro Regional Training Officer for DNR Enforcement. I've uh, been a conservation officer for the last uh, almost 16 years now been in law enforcement all my life, but grew up hunting and uh, enjoyed a lot of seasons with the muzzleloader. Uh, you know, muzzleloader season has changed. The rules have changed over the years uh, many times. Now it's open statewide on all the lands. But back when I started uh, muzzleloader hunting, it was only allowed in certain wildlife management areas across the state. Very good. Um, so can you see my uh, PowerPoint pulled up there? Yep, you're good to go. Okay. Let's see. So let's start out a little bit with um, the legal info, Phil, and uh, tell us what you what you can about the the legalities of hunting with a muzzleloader. Sure, muzzleloader season is open statewide now. Uh, throughout Minnesota. It uh, is a season unto itself. Um, the muzzleloader season is a 16 day deer season uh, beginning the Saturday nearest November 27th. Uh, or this year, it's, it is uh, uh, the Saturday after uh, the Thanksgiving day uh, and runs for 16 days statewide. And <clears throat> what, what makes a legal muzzleloader? Yeah, a legal muzzle loader is uh, uh, a firearm that is loaded by at the muzzle, um, and uh, typically you pour the powder in or the powder charge, and then put the bullet on top of it and ram that down the barrel. Okay. And then the ignition source is can be several different things. It can be a uh, a primer. It can be a cap lock. It can be a flintlock ignition, uh, and that's usually done at the breach. Okay. So is muzzleloader season open for either sex, or is it dependent on the deer permit area? It depends up upon the deer permit area. Uh, it's a season, a standalone season of itself. You can apply for uh, an antlerless deer permit in a lottery deer area. Uh, if it's a deer hunting permit area that is a uh, hunter's choice area, then it's a deer of either sex. If you're hunting in a two deer limit, then it's a deer of either sex, and you can also use a a bonus permit. Uh, if it's if you're hunting in an area that is a three deer limit, uh, uh, formerly referred to as an intensive harvest area, then you could have. Uh, uh, a deer of either sex and use two bonus permits. And the CWD zones are also open during the muzzleloader season as well. Okay. And when I was working Saturday and Sunday, um, we had a couple people come in and say that they had a curious conversation with the ELS agent and they were offering them a bonus permit for an area that was lottery only. And I said, you know, they could probably sell you a bonus permit, but it can't be filled in 
the permit area that you were just hunting in, you're gonna have to go to a two deer limit area and be able to use that that bonus permit. So really, really check out, you know, if if your ELS person is telling you to, you can buy a bonus permit, make sure you, you refer to the map and the next uh, slide is gonna talk about that. But uh, the, the restriction, it says bonus permits may be used to take antlerless deer during uh, the regular firearm se- and muzzleloader season if the person has a valid license for that season. And I think we might have skipped over um, the definition of a legal buck. So uh, that's a pretty important one. And why don't you tell us what a legal buck looks like? A, a legal buck is any deer with an antler of three inches or length of length uh, or more. <laughs> so it has to have one antler that's three inches long, then it's a legal buck. If you have okay. uh, a fawn buck that has short nubs or anything less than three inches, then it's considered an antlerless deer. Yep. Um, one permit area that I failed to mention too is we have a few permit areas in the state of Minnesota that are buck only. So if you mm-hmm. are hunting in a buck only permit area, you are restricted to buck only with your muzzleloader license. And and the reason have... go ahead for those the reason for those buck only areas is because the population is you know down and we need to protect the females, the uh, the ones that are going to bring new fawns into the the herd and help increase that population. So that's that's why we do that as the the DNR. So let me go to the next slide here. And this map shows all of the deer permit areas and they're color coded. So the yellow up here are uh, one deer limit bucks only. The blue area um, are antlerless permit by lottery. So if you didn't get drawed by the middle of September, uh, you're not going to be able to to harvest an antlerless deer. Um, the brown sections are either sex, so it's your choice as to to what you want to harvest. The salmon colored areas are a two deer limit. The green areas are a three deer limit. And on this map, the five deer are the purple areas. And uh, the, the cost for the license is exactly the same as what we would um, firearms license or archery tag would be. And uh, the non-residents can also come over and black powder hunt. Uh, 185 is the non-resident fee for that. We'll go ahead and advance. So licenses in Minnesota come on sale on August 1st and they'll run through the close of the season. Phil, what's the, the rule on buying a license after opening day? Sure, uh, if you purchase your license after the start of the season, uh, if you do it prior to the start of shooting hours, which is a half hour before sunrise, that tag is legal that day. If you buy it after the start of shooting hours that day, the tag is, uh, is legal the next following day. Right, and we've we've got that little snippet in here about the three inches of polished antler. That's a that's a big thing to remember. Um, Antlerless, they're allowed by by permit, and that drawing, um, as soon as they come out in August, you can get your name in the hat for the antlerless tag. Um, and this year it was September 9th, my birthday. And I thought, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to buy my my license and I'm going to, for my birthday, I'm going to get a antlerless permit. And apparently whoever was picking numbers this year didn't didn't get the memo and didn't pick me. Um, so uh, hunting in the lottery area, hunters must have their antlerless permit to take antlerless deer. Uh, during the muzzleloader season, application deadline is the same as the general firearms. So back to that first week in September. I think it's it's important to note that uh, 
if you partook in the regular firearm season or the regular archery season, you are still allowed to purchase a license and partake in the muzzleloader season as well. Okay. So we're still only allowed one buck though, correct? You're still only allowed one buck in most parts of the state. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I want to confuse the issue talking about CWD rules, but uh, my part of the state in the Southeast, we have a lot of CWD, uh, that purple area that you talked about. So mm -hmm. we have a little bit different rules there. Yep. But what I like to tell people is find out where you're going to hunt first. Look on the map and see what your designation is and then see what that area allows you to do. Deer permit areas can change from year to year too, from mm -hmm. lottery to one deer to two deer to three deer. So mm -hmm. you need to check that each year prior to your purchase of your license. So let's talk a little bit about the equipment. Um, on the slide here, uh, it says 40 caliber or larger for a smooth bore um, or for a rifled barrel, 40 caliber or larger for a smooth bore, 45 caliber. Um, tell us about a, why, why that difference in size is there. Well, a rifle barrel is just that it has rifling that helps stabilize your bullet. Uh, so those uh, muzzle loaders that are 40 caliber or larger that have rifled barrels are legal. And if you have a smooth bore, then your, your ball needs to be larger. And so you need to go to a minimum of a 45 caliber if you're shooting a smooth bore muzzle loader. So like a muzzle loading shotgun, you can actually load um, a single patched ball in that and be able to 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 deer hunt with that but it has the, to be 45 caliber or larger correct perfect um currently uh breech loading muzzle loaders are are not um they can't be used but we've got a slide coming up or just down here a little bit um that it's being looked at to be legal in 2022. So that's going to be a big change to um, muzzleloader deer hunters. They can use the, the new technology out there in the field. Um, Phil and I talked this morning a little bit about powder. And uh, Phil, you like loose powder? I do. I use, I use what they call a, a, a loose powder. It's called black horn, uh, but it's if you're going to use that specific of powder, you need to also match the proper ignition system with that powder. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on the type of powder you use, whether it's a, uh, uh, a pellet or a stick or a loose powder, you still mm -hmm. need to match that <coughs> proper ignition system with that <laughs> material. Excuse me. Um... And I'm I'm the other school. I like to use the um, the pellets, and that just a compressed um, block of powder. <coughs> so they're they're both cleaner burning. James, you want to talk for a minute? <coughs> sure, Craig. Um... So one of the, so I, I'm really stoked about this talk because I am um, the brand new owner, new to me of a, uh, of a, of a new um, black powder rifle um, of 50 caliber uh, muzzle loader. So uh, all of this stuff, you know, I think one thing that, that I'm looking uh, to, to pick both of your brains about on this is, you know, the rules and the regs are great. I'm glad we're talking about them. I kind of want to know, you know, why, you know, like, what is it that you enjoy about muzzleloader hunting? You know, Phil, like, why do, why do you choose to do it? You know, for, <laughs> it, from my perspective as a newbie in the, in, the, in the realm of black powder, you know, A, it opens up more opportunities, right? Like, it's, it's, it's after the regular firearm season for the most part um, with, with the, 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 the noted exception of the late, uh, the late hunt for the 300 series, but also, you know, the thing that appeals to me about it is just, it's, it's kind of that, 
it's kind of an intermediate between archery hunting where, you know, I've got to be right on top of that deer. I've got to be 30 yards uh, from that animal and rifle hunting where I can be up to 200 yards. I feel comfortable out to 200 yards and black powder is kind of, it's an intermediate, um, it's, it's a different sort of thing. Uh, it also, you know, I appreciate the fact that, you know, I've basically got one shot, so it better be a, a, a good one. So, you know, could you, you know, why did you get into black powder hunting, Phil? Yeah, I started black powder hunting because it was a, an added opportunity to hunt. Uh, it, and it, it does have that, uh, that feel of going back, uh, back in time, so to speak, and how they used to hunt. Uh, mm -hmm. There is an added, added challenge to the black powder. Um, you only have one shot. You have to be sure of your shot. Uh, it helps teach that. Um, so it, it's just an added opportunity, and it and it's a uh, it's a time to get out in the woods when when the weather's colder. There's snow in the ground. Uh, the the mating season, for the most part, is is behind us. Um, there is that secondary rut that occurs at some time, but most of your black powder hunts involve uh, the bedding in the food source and uh, that challenge to intercept between the two. Um, it just uh, it's 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 a much more enjoyable hunt. It, you can. You don't need a, a group of people to partake in. You can enjoy it on your own, much much like a archery hunter is a mostly a solo hunter. Uh, it just gave that added opportunity to enjoy the woods at a later time of year. Yes, Craig, why did you start black powder hunting? Extension of the hunting opportunity. You know, um, the the guys that. I firearms hunted with uh, some of us archery hunted. Uh, we all firearms hunted, but then the muzzleloader season was was just another opportunity to to get out there. And if um, we had open tags where we hadn't shot a deer yet, it was a chance to get out there. Um, <clears throat> and and we used similar hunting tactics that we used. Um, you know, with firearms, and uh, but it was just, you know, a, a, another opportunity to get out there and, and chase whitetail. Um, never really was a, a a trophy hunter. I just liked the opportunity to have a a deer in my freezer, and if I hadn't accomplished it, this was just another avenue to get it done. Um. So I don't know how long you've been muzzleloader hunting now, James. <laughs> this is my, I mean, I, I haven't had, I haven't, I haven't gone muzzleloader hunting. I just got the, I just got the, uh, the muzzleloader this year. So it's, it's, um, okay. you know, I, I got to get out. I got to get out to the range. That's what, that's what I got to do. Yep. So. And <clears throat> the, the process isn't really that much different than sighting in your 30, 30, or, uh, in, in my case, a, a scoped muzzleloader. But let's cover this last slide here. Um, so if if I'm a muzzleloader deer hunter, all tagging, registration, party hunting rules, blaze orange requirements remain the same during the muzzleloader season as they do for the regular firearm season. Correct. And uh, the, the transporting of a muzzleloader um, needs to be unloaded to be transported in a vehicle. Now, what that means is removing the ignition source. So I'm just gonna hold this up to the camera. Those are 209 shotgun primers. If I take that out of my rifle, even with the ball and pellets in there, it's considered unloaded and safe to transport because there's no ignition um, system in there. The casing requirements remain the same, um, <clears throat> whether you're transporting a muzzleloader or a modern firearm. Uh, you know, snapped, buckled, zipped, or tied was the way I learned it back in the day. And, um, you know, a, a muzzleloader is 
almost as expensive as a center fire rifle. And in some cases, they're they're even more. And uh, I want to protect that value, you know, that someday I can hand that rifle off to someone else and they can enjoy it. So pull your, your ignition system. Um, how would you do it on a, on a flintlock? Do you, you get that fine charging powder just off the pan and you're good? Or the or the cap off your if it's a if it's a cap lock, right. small caps come off the nipple. But like on a on a flint lock, how do you how do you unload that one? Just take the the fine Re Yeah, remove that powder off the powder pan. Okay. <clears throat> um and then you're good to go. Case them up and you can transport them in your vehicle just like any other firearm. And uh, muzzle loaders are firearms that need to be cased uh, when transported. There are some exceptions out there, um, you know, and unless you're very sure of going from your residence to your place of hunting that I can transport that in my pickup, um, I, I wouldn't chance it. I would just put the gun in a case, drive it down the road, take it out, go into the woods and enjoy my hunt and return it to that case. Uh, Cause I want to protect it. So, all right, let's go to the next one here. And that's our little thank you slide. So I'm going to stop sharing and all of us, I think brought <clears throat> some, uh, some things to share. There we go. So now we got the full screen. And uh, this little bag here that I'm holding up is called my possible bag. And inside that bag, <clears throat> I carry my, my spare powder, my primers, a basic loading tool, and usually one or two speed loaders. So I've got my pellets in there and my bullet. And this is just a smaller pocket version, but you can see the, the back of the bullet. So that's what I carry in my possible bag. What kind of bag do you carry, Bill? Yeah. I've taken a, just a basic hip pouch bag and converted yep. it and, uh, it depends on what firearm I'm using. If I'm using my cap lock versus my inline, the equipment I put in it, but uh, very similar. I like a granular powder, so I pre-measure the powder in these little cylinders, and, they, and then the primers go in the top here. So I put this around my neck. I have a reload right in front of me for the powder and the primer, and then I'll have a, another I use uh, on an inline. I'll use a uh, a bullet like this with the with the wad connected to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. So once I pour the powder in, I just put this on the barrel and put it down the barrel. So. Very nice, James. Have you picked up a possible bag yet? Um, no, no. I, I you know I, I I don't have a possible bag. Um, you know I've got a little fanny pack. I think that's that's. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that'll do. That's what I carry when I archery hunt. So I'll just repurpose that. Um, I'm a big fan of of using things that I've already got. Um, so, yep. you know, there's I the 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 rifle that I got is a is one of the older school. So Craig's Craig's um, muzzle loader is a. So when when we're talking about muzzle loading, there's a couple of distinctions to make. Um, one of the big ones is whether it's an inline um, muzzle loader. And that's what Craig has got right now. So you can see he can open up that breech section um, and and get access to it there, but he still is loading the ammunition from the front. So he's still got that ramrod. The projectile that's coming out of the barrel has to go down the barrel um, to get to that. Um, whereas uh, Phil and I have the more traditional, you know, just straight up muzzle loader. You know, it looks like the old, 
plains rifles or it's this one isn't the full woodstock kentucky version but you know mm -hmm. we got our whereas craig opened up his breech to put his uh to put his primer in there you know i've got a a spot where a primer cap sits onto here i'll load all the my powder and my um, projectile down here and then this hammer will sl slam down on that primer causing a small explosion which will then ignite the gunpowder in the barrel and and that's where you get your boom so a yep. couple different ways and predating this is the flintlock that craig was talking about earlier where you didn't have a nice little cap that sat on top of a post when they call it a nipple um but you didn't have that you had a, a literally a piece <laughs> of rock that struck a piece of metal that would spark into a pan that was holding very fine very uh flammable powder that would then ignite the powder in the barrel so you'd get two little i mean those 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 ones get real smoky real quick um so a couple of different options for for muzzle loaders um you know craig's is craig's is a very modern uh version it's it's uh they almost looks like a shotgun um but and it's got a nice scope on it and this one just has old iron sights on it because i don't know i I watched Jeremiah Johnson as a kid, the old the old movie, and uh, with uh, Robert Redford. And I figured if I'm gonna if I'm if I'm gonna get a muzzle loader, I'm gonna get an old timey one and and uh, and do it that way. I uh, I started muzzle loading before you could put a scope on, and um, my eyes. When I when I look down that front sight and put the the orange um, front sight on that deer, it looked like a basketball on the shoulder of that deer. And uh, I pulled the trigger, and the sky filled with smoke. And I had no idea whether I hit that deer or not. And uh, I got down and walked over there and found blood right away. And uh got the deer so when scopes became legal i i liked that option and um phil do you hunt with a scope on your inline or i do uh, this is the different style inline than what you have there yep. to open this one you can it breaks open like this and you can remove the the cap it doesn't have a bolt on it like your style. Yep. Um, but uh, it's one thing to note is these firearms are legal in the regular firearm season as well. Yep. And you can always use scopes, but during the muzzleloader season, we had to remove our scopes for quite a few years. Now we can leave our scopes on during the muzzleloader season. But this is a quick detach mount uh, that I can just twist this and I can pop this scope off and still use the open sights for that purpose so uh i did that because i wanted to use this during the regular firearm season at times because that's legal in the shotgun came. zone what's that it's legal in the shotgun zone as well yeah they're legal statewide so but when the muzzle of our season came then i had to remove the scope so i could do a quick detach on the scope okay so so as 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 somebody who's new to this all right, and you know, I've I've got I've got my I've got my rifle, I've got some some powder, I've got my uh, I got a couple of different projectiles that I'll be uh, experimenting with. Like, um, my understanding is that as we as I go down this path, you know, it's it it sounds like muzzle loading and muzzle lo shooting muzzle loaders is a lot. There's a lot more like shotgun shooting. Um, because you really have to tailor your load and the projectile to that individual firearm. Um, you know, like when I'm patterning turkey loads, you know, like there's some loads that my gun really likes and there's some loads that my gun just really doesn't like. And so I feel like that's the route that I got to go down. So right now, you know, like when we're talking about the, 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 the thought process that goes into muzzle loading. And so it's not just dropping in a charge or, or a cartridge and, and, and going out, you know, you've got to, if you're using loose powder, like, like uh, Phil does, and like, I've got, you know, you actually measure it out by the grain. And so, 
you know, when I go to the firing range, I'm, I'm expecting to start off with like 80 grains maybe and see where that puts the, the, the projectile that I'm shooting and, and, and work up from there because I don't want to start too high um, because I don't want to shoot a bunch of times and just have that recoil coming into my shoulder. Um, so like, is, is that a, is that a good strategy? Do you, do y'all, do y'all have any advice for that? I, I can tell you that these are measured out. This is, this is my hunting rounds, uh, preloaded at 90 grains. So, uh, I found that, that going much more than that didn't give me any more performance and actually gave me less accuracy having a higher charge behind it. But you're right in the fact that I spent a lot of time on the range figuring that out. Um, but just because you have more powder doesn't mean you're more accurate. That's that doesn't equate. Um, you have to find the right powder you're comfortable with shooting and how it how it your firearm treats that. So it's very much like finding the right shotgun round to shoot. Uh, <coughs> it's a little bit more involved though. So uh, if you're measuring black powder versus black horn powder, it's a different type of granulars too. So you may have to uh, measure that differently. I found that I have to, this is in my measuring device here. It's set at 90 grains. And when I measure the black horn, I have to tap this to settle that powder because it's, it's the chunks are bigger than regular black powder. So mm -hmm. If you don't do that, you'll get a void in there and you won't get an accurate measurement. So that's one thing to note. Um, if you, when you measure with this, you want your powder right level with the top, that'll give you the accurate measure. So yeah, I, you could even start off with 60 grains of black powder and go up from there. Uh, but if, once you get in between that 80 to 100 grains going more than a, 100 grains of black powder isn't going to get you uh, any more velocity, any more knockdown power or, or harvestability uh, out of that bullet. And it may even affect your accuracy uh, mm -hmm. to the negative side of things. So um, more, more is not always better. Find that sweet spot. And for me, it was 90 grains of that black corn powder. Nice. With the, the pellets, I could get those in 30 grain pellets or 50 grain pellets. So three pellets would give me a 90 grain load or two of the 50 would give me a 100 grain load. And the particular rifle that I have would go up to 150 grains. Um, I don't need to shoot that many grains of powder. Um, for whitetail, you know, 100 uh, or 90 is usually plenty. Um, you know, just get my scope zeroed into that that load, and it shoots just fine. So nice. Any questions coming in yet, James? Um, I'm not seeing any. So yeah, I think if if folks that are tuned in, if if um, you know, if if you've got questions, please direct them to the Q and A. We've had a couple of things come in in the chat. Um, and, um, yeah, we'll, uh, um, yeah, so we did get one comment in the chat from Ben, um, and, you know, it is, it is really important to make sure you look, again, this is, I'm, I'm finding this stuff out as we go, but it is, it's always important to look at the barrel and know the kind of barrel it is. If this is an old gun that you've got um, that you've either inherited or, or come across um, second hand or third or fourth hand, um, make sure you have an idea. I mean, you should be able to look up what that firearm is, um, who manufactured it, and you should be able to find out what the tolerances of that barrel are because some of the older, older guns you know, they, they may not tolerate some of the newer loads uh, at high grains, um, what have you. So if it isn't old, like most modern muzzle loaders, you're going to you're going to be fine. They're, they're engineered real well these days. But, you know, back in the day, um, it, the, the metal wasn't designed for some of the charges that we've got these days. So 
and that's true with with almost any firearm it's not just muzzle loaders like old shotguns it's the same sort of thing so make sure you you check out that firearm make sure you take a look at it make sure you know what that barrel is capable of doing before you uh take it out to the range so we got a question from uh jeff on walking through the loading procedure and um so the first thing I would do is put my powder charge and my selected bullet. And I would use my short starter here to get the bullet to start down the barrel. I would use my longer starter to get it down. And then I would pull my, my ramrod and work it down the barrel hand over hand you don't want to grab it up here at the end and try to push it all the way down, just hand over hand until you get it seated on the bottom. And a lot of guys will put a line on there so they know when that charge is all the way seated to the bottom. And uh, if you pull up your ramrod and you let it drop and it doesn't bounce, there's an airspace in there somewhere. So you might want to pack it down a little bit more until you get it to where it'll bounce. So now I've got the, the barrel loaded. I would open mine up, put an ignition system in there, and then it's got a safety on the side. Red is fire, white is safe, and that's the way I would go out and, and, and be in my deer stand. Um, anything different on loading the, the do you have a, um, where do you carry your extra powder, Phil? Do you have a powder horn? I, I don't have a powder horn, but I, I preload uh, these uh, plastic cylinders with my charge. Right. So I just put one of these off, pour that in the barrel, yep. and then grab a bullet, same thing, put it down the barrel. You always want to load your powder first, then your projectile. The last thing you do is put in your ignition system. Once you put your ignition system on, then your firearm is considered loaded. So using the loose powder, Phil had lifted up a brass um, volume measure. And if you had a powder horn, you would pour the powder into the powder measure and then put the powder measure into the muzzle. You'd never want to go directly from your powder horn into your firearm. Um, that's just way too much powder. You're not being able to gauge how much is going in. So always use a, a powder measure and it's by volume. It's not necessarily by, by a weight, is it? Correct, it's, it's volume. That's why I say if that Blackborn powder, the new style, has larger granules. So if you don't tap it and settle it, you may have uh, air pockets in there and and you may have inconsistent measuring. So that's why I always tap mine and settle yep. it in there and then top it off. And it I mean when I when I first started muzzle loading I shot a round ball um, patched round ball gun and uh, that's all that gun would shoot. It was a one in 66 twist. It had the um, traditional Hawken look. And um, so back then I had a powder horn and a measure and loose powder. And um, when I got to the, the inline stuff, there was a lot less things that I had to carry with me. So let's see here. Um, Jay wants to know, any recommendation on on scopes magnific magnification? I see you had a, a pretty good size scope on yours, on your inline. Yeah, you know, any any scope that will handle a high powered rifle will handle the recoil of the black powder. Uh, and this scope came from a, a a rifle that I had that I wanted to upgrade the scope on that particular rifle. So. Uh, this happens to be a, a, a three to nine power, uh, but the magnification is if you're hunting in, you know, brushy areas, you don't want the high magnification because you won't be able to find your animal in brushy areas. Uh, so that 
that's kind of a personal choice, but you want something that will handle a recoil of a rifle. Uh, if you use a scope that is designed for like a like a rimfire, like a 22, it may not be able to handle the recoil of of the rifle. So living up here in the, the far north, the opposite end of the state from where Phil's at, we've got a lot more brush, a lot more timber. And I chose a one to five. And the fact that the camel pattern matched the camel pattern on the stock, I, I found that appealing. So, um, you know, it just looked nice. So that's why I picked that one. Um, on the traditional guns, are those drilled and tapped, James, for scope yeah. mounts or? You you can you can mount a scope on them. Um, you know, I right now my eyes are still good enough that I I'm I'm happy to try to get by without one. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've I've seen I've seen mounts on them. Jeff asked a, a interesting question: Are there pros and cons of smooth bore versus rifled? Well, your your rifled muzzle loader is going to be just like your rifled high power rifle, and it's going to impart a spin on that bullet to make it travel truer to your target. Um, a smooth bore gun doesn't have any rifling and usually you're gonna shoot just a patched round ball in there. And I've got a really good friend that um, <clears throat> has written books on, on muzzle loaded hunting and he shoots a 1700s fouling rifle or fouling piece. So it's smooth bore, and he can shoot uh, small game and birds, or he can put a lead round ball in there and harvest a deer. And, uh, you know, if if that's the direction that muzzle loading takes you, that's great. Um, Phil and I were talking earlier about this, and I support anybody that wants to get out there and and participate. It doesn't matter which piece of equipment that you choose, you're still a hunter. And as long as you're working within the the legal boundaries that we have, I think you should be free to hunt with what you choose. So that's just my thought on that. I th I think there's a really I, I think this dovetails nicely into you know again there's all this variability with with muzzle loading that you can get into and and when you're talking about rifling, um, different rifled barrels they're not all created equal so we you've already heard people talk about <laughs> round balls and um the twist rate and the twist rate is the amount how how uh how much spin the barrel will impart on a projectile and so when you're talking about a one in 66 twist that's a that's a pretty um slow spin um uh it takes a long time for for that to to make a full spin and so some of the new some of the older guns that were only for patched round balls um had that had that spin because that's what stabilized the projectile the best um there are other rifles that have tighter spins uh, or faster spins and those are specifically designed for more modern projectiles like um conical bullets or sabos or what have you and then the the one that I've got and and the the traditional one that that Phil has, it's kind of an intermediate spin to kind of try to be a jack of all trades between those things. So, when you're getting into this stuff like I am, you know, it, it can be a little overwhelming at first, but it really comes down to again getting out to the range, practicing with the stuff, finding what works with that barrel, finding what works with that firearm, finding out what works for you, um, so that you can make a, a good shot. There's a uh, Nathan pointed out it's important when reloading to limit the oxygen in the breech, keeping the cap on until ready to recap. Um, also keep body parts away from the muzzle when loading. So you don't want to bring that thing in tight to your chest and do your work. Set it out in front of you. Um, he talks in his question about um, a spark that remained in the barrel and that spark ignited the powder as you poured it you know your next charge down um when i used to shoot a little competition i would see the guys and they would blow um just to make sure that there was no um embers in there before they went back to reload again 
um, it's it's not a very fast process, and with shooting the the pellets, I've I haven't seen or heard of um, an ember being in there and then dropping a pellet on top. It's more with the the loose powder that I've heard of that happening. But uh, safety all the way around, you know, if you're concerned that there could be an ember in there, um, you got to give it a little more time to burn out or find a way to to blow that ember out the the barrel. Craig, there's a question from Dave about uh, could y'all talk about muzzle loader uh, versus rifle bullet velocity? So is he asking muzzle loader to center fire rifle? I believe so. Your your muzzle loader is going to be considerably slower than um, than your high power rifle. Um, Phil, do you know for sure the the ballistics on the I'm just looking on my box here to see if I had anything that would tell me. Yeah, that. The ballistics is going to vary depending on what load you're loading, you know, that, and you get to choose that load. So it's going to vary a great deal. Uh, probably more consistent with a shotgun slug versus a rifle. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, it's going to be much slower moving, uh, maybe a heavier ball. The, uh, I'm just looking for how heavy the, the the these bullets that I shoot are 250 grain bullets. You know, mm -hmm. if you're shooting a center fire rifle at deer, you may be shooting something that's 100 to 140 grain uh, right. bullet, uh, and your your powder load behind that bullet is much different than the smokeless powder of a rifle. So it's going to very greatly depending on what your choice is and there's a lot of choices out there uh you just have to decide first your firearm and then once you have the firearm that you're going to use what type of charge is best for that firearm uh, is it going to be regular black powder is it going to be a pirate x pellet is it going to be uh, some type of uh more of a hotter burning uh blackhorn powder like i use so uh mm -hmm. That's going to change your velocity on your bullet, depending on what charge and how much powder you use. And I, I, I really like your analogy about comparing it to a muzzle loader or a muzzle loader to a shotgun. It, it's a much slower um, velocity. And somebody asked the range. What's the farthest you've shot your muzzle loader? Do you limit well, yourself? The the furthest distance, yep. this this muzzle loader I'm capable to shoot comfortably out to 200 yards with this scope setup. Now, if I didn't have the scope on it, we would cut that down to 75 yards because of my eye. <laughs> so yep. it depends on your mechanism, your firearm, and and uh, your open sights versus scopes. Uh, now, just because this firearm is capable of shooting up to 200 yards doesn't necessarily mean I'm comfortable at taking an ethical shot of an animal to harvest at that distance either. So I have done 200 yards on the range and I know what my drop is, um, but I would not take that 200 yard shot. One, where I hunt, I don't see 200 yards because of the woods and the brush. Um, and two, I'm just, if I'm not confident at that, that I'm going to make an ethical harvestable shot on an animal, I don't take it. So. Up here in the, the big north woods, um, I usually shoot my gun at 50 yards. And uh, maybe I'll shoot it at 100 yards. But 50 to 75 yards in this thick brush that we have up here, that's a long shot. And... Uh, that's you know the the magnification on my scope of one to five um, is is set up for that that distance um, uh, three by nine my God you could see the next county I think you know with that much magnification unless you but, have eyes like mine then then that gets you to two hundred yards <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
so I, I, I keep my, my shots reasonable. Um, you know, if I'm bow hunting, I'm, I'm really confident out to 20, um, 30 yards, my group starts to open up a little bit. So I, I shoot a bow if I can keep, you know, my five arrows on a paper plate at 20 yards, I'm good to go. Um, but I don't, I don't push the boundaries of my capability or my equipment. And with my muzzle loader, 50 to 75 yards, I'm, I'm real confident that I'm going to hit that deer. Even at 100 yards up here, we don't get that many 100 yard shot opportunities unless you're sitting on a field or something like that. But uh, there, so there's. Craig, we, go ahead. No, sorry. We got, a, we got a question from Matt. How often do you need to clean the barrel? Are there any issues if you don't clean it? And does powder type make a difference? Yes, to all of those. Um, yes, you should clean your, your firearm after using it. And I use a product called bore butter. So think of the inside of your barrel, like a cast iron skillet. I want to season that, that inside of the bore, just like my cast iron fry pan. And, um, after cleaning it and this sounds kind of strange, but soapy water tends to be the best cleaning supply for for cleaning a black powder gun um you can stick the barrel right down in a, a bucket of soapy water and use your ramrod as a as a pump and, and suck that water up and push it back out um to, to clean out the falling dry it out good and then use this this bore butter to season your your barrel so that uh you know it, it's going to last a lot longer um, I had the privilege of helping a friend. Uh, he showed up with a, a muzzleloader that he had used a season before, and he said, I can't get the breech plug out. And we worked and worked and worked to get the breech plug out, and he had left his charge in there with no primer on it, of course, but um, we really had to work on that gun to get it back into shooting shape. and. Um, I don't know, Phil. How often do you clean yours? Well, it depends on which one I'm shooting. If I'm shooting the cap lock with black powder and uh, using a, a black powder uh, cleaner, I clean it probably every shot, every other shot for sure. Uh, you can buy cleaning patches that are are preconditioned with cleaner. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a little. I had it right in front of me here. Um, a little piece that screws on the end of your ramrod. It's a little uh, metal piece, and that will hold your patch <coughs> around it. So you can just screw that into your ramrod, put your patch around it, and run it through your barrel every other shot. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are on the range and you want consistent shooting, you want to make sure that following clears your barrel every time. So using black powder and black powder cleaner is the best way to go. Uh, that goes for the Pyrodex style pellets as well. But if you are going to go with a product like Blackhorn, this you use a synthetic cleaner like you would a rifle, oh. uh, a regular uh oil related cleaning mechanism so uh it all depends on what you're shooting as far mm -hmm. as powder uh they make certain cleaners but when it comes to black powder and final cleanup of the day nothing beats a sink full of soapy water it, now, now is that soapy water hot or cold or does it matter uh cold wouldn't be i, I would use warm water uh warm water and a, a you know a dish detergent so uh but you you want to keep that black powder seasoned like you would your black cast iron fry pan you know yep all right we got one more oh a couple more questions coming in um do you need to break in the barrel like you do with a new rifle I'm I'm trying to think what I did when I got mine, and uh, 
I I didn't I didn't break it in necessarily like I'd break in a a rifle where I shoot one, clean one, shoot two, clean two. Um, I went out and shot it, uh, learned about the gun, cleaned the gun, went back to the range, shot it some more. Um, but Phil, what do you think? Do you do the shoot one clean, shoot two clean to break in a muzzle loader barrel? Uh, you know, I've never actually broke in a muzzle loader barrel. I just used it, but you, you got to season it though. And yep. if you're talking about breaking it in and seasoning it in the same context, then I, then I would guess going to the range and running several loads through it would be breaking it in. You're also seasoning that barrel too, but uh, proper cleaning with black powder. If you get corros corrosion down that barrel and you get uh, some rust spots on your rifling, you're going to, you're not going to have uh, proper stabilization of your projectile if you have that in your barrel. So um, I don't know that there's a break-in period, so to speak, but uh, the more you use it, the more you should clean it and clean it between shots, especially early on, you want a lot of lubrication in there. But let me warn you, if you use a, a, a cleaner with black powder like this and you leave that, and that, and that pools in the bottom of your barrel and you pour your powder in and put a charge on, you might not get that to fire right away because you might wet, dampen your powder. So, uh, you, uh, you know, the old story about keep your powder dry, uh, that term uh, is yep. very true when it comes to black powder. And it may, might have been started in the old days with, uh, with, with that, uh, uh, the use of black powder guns but uh, uh if you dampen that powder even leaving too much cleaner in there it can do it and uh, mm -hmm. uh so make sure you shoot it out clean your gun and make sure that bore is dry and that leads into the last question we've got which is um can y'all talk about hang fires uh especially because people forget that that they leave them with a with a charge in them and forget about it and the powder gets damp so are there are there good ways to prevent that or how, how do y'all how do y'all handle that situation? Yeah, one one thing that I do is uh, after I clean a gun, I will run a uh, uh, firing mechanism, whether it's a primer or a cap or something, and shoot shoot out the barrel after I'm cleaning it. Uh, that will blow out any moisture that's left in there, any too much moisture. Um, and then load it for hunting. Uh, I've always made a practice of that. So um, that, however, that's going to leave a little bit of fouling left. So if you do that and then hunt with it and then clean it when you're done hunting. So, so the, that was one thing I was gonna talk about was, you know, when you're done, you can put a cap in there. It helps dry out the, the, the barrel and the old timers, the guys that were teaching me back then, they would, you know, point the barrel down and, and make sure that the leaf actually moved to show that the bore was was clear. Um, the term hang fire, I was reading the question here. Uh, a hang fire is a perceptual delay in the ignition process. So, and black powder is one of the probably the prime examples you pull the trigger, the firing pin hits, the cap goes off, the powder starts to burn, and then you hear boom. And it's, it just seems like, boy, am I concentrating on my target a long time to get that round to go off. If that happened in your center fire rifle, you'd think, boy, there's, there's a real problem here or something. But with black powder, it, it's almost every shot that's very slow process. Nice. Well, gentlemen, it's it's one o'clock. We gotta let folks go. Um, so, I think Phil uh, wanted to show us pulling the breach on his real quick there. Go for it, Phil. Real quick. Okay. Some muzzle loaders you can you can remove the plug and clean your barrel straight through. The the, the cap locks and the flint locks you can't do that on, but new inlines you can, which aids in your cleaning a ton. But yep. this. 
needs to get cleaned very well because yep. this is your ignition source. So just something to know. Very good. Nice. We could talk about muzzle loaders a long time, but I know we have to go. <laughs> Well, I both, uh, Phil, thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge with us. Uh, it's, I know it's a busy time of the year for conservation officers, um, but we really appreciate you taking the time to talk muzzle loading. Um, you know, the firearms season for, um, for the, the 200 and 300 unit is going to wrap up here on Sunday, and then the 100 unit is a week from then. So um, get out there, um, keep your powder dry, uh, have a lot of fun, and um, yeah, good luck out there. So thanks so much. Thanks, Phil. Take care. You bet. Have a great day.